We are pleased to have Gregory McNamee kicking off our Writers in Their Own Residence series, sponsored by the Arizona State Library, Archives, and Public Records. Those familiar with our various programs will recognize Greg from his Arizona Humanities Council presentations. Greg is a writer, journalist, editor, photographer, and publisher. He is the author or title page editor of 40 books and over 5,000 periodical publications. He is a consultant, contributor, and contributing editor to the Encyclopedia Britannica and reviews for Kirkus Reviews. In his spare time, Greg is a research associate at the Southwest Center of the University of Arizona and a lecturer in the Economics Department of the Eller College of Management. Today, he's bringing you Arizona in Literature. At the close of the American War with Mexico back in 1846, a young military officer named William Tecumseh Sherman surveyed the newly conquered lands of the desert. And he returned to Washington, D.C., and he went to see President Zachary Taylor, who asked Sherman, will our new possessions pay for the blood and treasure spent in this war? Sherman replied, General, I feel we'll have to go to war again. And Taylor, concerned, asked him why, and he said, to make him take the damn country back. Maxwell Perkins, the legendary editor who helped launch the careers of Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings, many other writers, uh, felt very much the same way as Sherman. Writing to the English novelist John Galsworthy, who after having completed seven installments of his great novel, The Forsyth Saga, was vacationing near Wickenburg. And Perkins remarked, I have very pleasant memories of Arizona. The only flaw in it was that at any given point in the landscape always looked so much better than it was when you got to it. And John Gregory Bork, a military officer and anthropologist who first came to Arizona during the Apache Wars, had many reservations about this place. He wrote, Dante, it has always seemed to me, made the mistake of his life in dying when he did 550 years ago. Had he held on to his mortal coil until after Uncle Sam had perfected the Gadsden Purchase, he would have found full scope for his genius in the description of a region in which not only purgatory and hell, but heaven likewise, had combined to produce a bewildering kaleidoscope of all that was wonderful, weird, terrible, and awe-inspiring, with not a little that was beautiful and romantic. Weird, terrible, beautiful, romantic. That's Arizona. But plenty of other places in this world are weird and terrible and beautiful and romantic. You only have to think of Tierra del Fuego or Siberia or the Sahara Desert or maybe Kansas. Telling just why Arizona is weird, terrible, beautiful, and romantic in its own special way why Arizona is different from, say, New Mexico, or California, or Utah, or for that matter, New Hampshire. That's been the job of generations of writers, all of whose work has made an uncommonly rich literature about this place. And it's much more complimentary on the whole than the three examples I've given you so far. That literature is rich because this place is rich. And it's astonishingly diverse. To begin thinking about this, let's begin on the northern line, straight as a gun barrel, where Arizona, Nevada, and Utah meet, and follow the alternating series of red sandstone escarpments eastward across the state. At the 109th meridian, where the four corners come together, we'll track straight south across wide mountain ranges and drainages of swift rivers and yucca-studded cliffs. Fierce country. Next, down by Mexico, we turn west at the 31st parallel, stair-stepping through grasslands, cactus forests, quartz sand, and lava. And finally, after jogging just a little bit at a place near what we call the Cabeza Prieta, we turn north a few degrees 
west of the 114th parallel along the Great Colorado River. And that's a long journey, one that defines the boundaries of 113,909 square miles. And you all better be taking notes back there because there will be a quiz on that, 113,909 square miles of some of the most varied landscapes on the planet. The huge uplift of the Colorado Plateau, dissected by the Colorado River through the 250 mile length of the Grand Canyon the mile-high rise of the Mogollon Rim, its black outcroppings of rhyolite and granite giving way to the jumbled Arizona interior, a place that looks like some giant toy box that has been very badly messed up. And then to the west, the stark solar desert. To the south, other deserts, the lush Sonoran Desert, the grassy Chihuahuan Desert, basin and range provinces, broken by southeastward tending mountains shading off into Mexico. Now, all of these varied landscapes have some things in common. And one of them is a basic fact of life in Arizona. And that is that most of them all the time are hot, 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 hot for most of the year. Here is J. Ross Brown, whose tale of the soldier in the blanket, sometimes it's changed to the cowboy in the blanket or the prospector in the blanket, but always the blanket. It's become a classic yarn about Arizona. And Ross Brown is writing about the area near Yuma. And he says, the climate in winter is finer than that of Italy. It would scarcely be possible to suggest an improvement. I never experienced such exquisite Christmas weather as we enjoyed during our sojourn. Perhaps fastidious people bite objects of the temperature in summer, when the rays of the sun attain their maximum force and the hot winds sweep in from the desert. It is said that a wicked soldier died here and was consigned to the fiery regions below for his manifold sins, but unable to stand the rigors of the climate he sent up for his blankets. I have even heard the complaint made that the thermometer failed to show the true heat because the mercury dried up. Everything dries. Wagons dry. Men dry. Chickens dry. There's no juice left in any living thing, living or dead, by the close of summer. Officers and soldiers are supposed to walk around creaking. Mules it is said, can only bray at midnight. And I have heard it hinted that the carcasses of cattle rattle inside their hides, and that snakes find it difficulty in bending their bodies, and horned frogs die of apoplexy. Chickens hatched at the season come out of the shell already cooked. Bacon is eaten with a spoon. The Indians sit in the river with fresh mud on their heads, and by dint of constant dipping and sprinkling, manage to keep from roasting, though they usually come out parboiled. Heat is a constant. And that's one thing. And so is another thing that the landscapes of Arizona have in common, <clears throat> and that is a lack of water. Here is a woman named Sue Summers who moved to Florence from San Francisco in 1879. And here's what she recorded in her diary. The next morning, my husband arrived in Casa Grande in a private conveyance, and we were soon en route to Florence, about 30 miles distant. I had heard so much of the raging Gila River, which I now understood we, much, we would have to cross before reaching our destination, that I must confess I had a feeling of fear at the prospect of fording it. Imagine my astonishment when we came to a halt within a short distance of Florence, and my husband, with an amusing smile, announced that the huge valley of sand on which we were resting was the bed of the Gila River. If you've been to Arizona, you will almost certainly have seen one of these rivers, at least, without water. It's one of our specialties out here, rivers without water, and it's something that astonishes every visitor from back east that I've ever known. How could you have water? Rivers without water? Well, we do. And here's another fact of life, though. 
in Arizona, and that is when it rains, it pours. The Belgian writer Georges Simenon, who wrote 500 detective novels, lived in uh, Tumacacri, down near Mexico, in the, late teen, in the late 1940s for a couple of years. And one night, he and his wife went to dinner at La Caverna, which was a famous restaurant just across the border in Nogales, Sonora, in Mexico. And coming home, they got caught in a torrential storm down on the Santa Cruz River, one that he recounted in his 1950 novel, Bottom of the Bottle. And here's how he remembers the event. He said, the meal was not quite over when an Indian burst wildly into the restaurant and several times shouted an incomprehensible word as he pointed out toward the mountain. What's he saying? I don't know. I'll go find out. Some American tourists were surprised to see their bill handed to them when, like us, they weren't finished eating yet. He came back nervous. They have to get out right away. The Red Mountain has a hat on it, as they put it. That means that at any moment, huge amounts of water are going to start pouring down, accompanied by violent winds. I pay and quickly put the top up on the car. What they told us is true. In a few minutes, a wall of water will be barreling down the arroyo, carrying everything before it. And there is no bridge between here and Tucson. I speed up. The sky has gotten darker. Sometimes we can see the arroyo, which already has a little water in it. There's a first ford halfway to our place, but it's too late when we get there. It's completely flooded. That's what happens every year. It can rain for two or three weeks and the waters just get higher and higher. Will we be isolated? We can say nothing more. I'm giving all the gas we can. We absolutely have to be at Tumacacri before the wall of water. Our, our, our arroyo, which we have never seen anything but dry, now has almost two feet of dirty brown water in it. We barely get across. In half an hour, or maybe less, the torrent will be over six feet deep, maybe deeper. The annual deluge surrounds our little house, which does not keep us from hearing the coyotes howling all night long. Once sheltered from the rain, we feel like laughing over our adventure. Isn't that the sort of thing, just what life out west is supposed to be like? Haven't we seen it in all kinds of movies without completely believing it? Well, if you've been here to witness a storm, you know how beautiful our state can be after a rain has fallen. Life seems so much better with a little bit of water in it. Uh, and here's testimonials taken from Tucson writer Barbara Kingsolver's first novel, The Bean Trees. And that novel centers on a young woman named Taylor Greer who has come to Tucson in the Sonora Desert from her hard scrabble life in Kentucky. She goes west in a battered Volkswagen and eventually she arrives, only to see a storm. She says a storm was coming up from the south, moving slowly. It looked something like a huge blue-gray shower curtain being drawn along by the hand of God. You could just barely see through it, enough to make out the silhouette of the mountains on the other side. From time to time, nervous white ribbons of lightning jumped between the mountaintops and the clouds. A cool breeze came up behind us, sending shivers along the spines of the mesquite trees. The birds were excited, flitting along the ground and perching on thin, wildly waving reed stalks. What still amazed me about the desert was all the life it had in it. I had come to Arizona expecting an endless sea of sand dunes. I had learned of deserts from old westerns and quick straw McGraw cartoons. But this desert was nothing like that. There were bushes and trees and weeds here, exactly the same as everywhere else, except that the colors were different and everything had thorns. The saguaros were the great big spiny ones, as tall as normal trees, but so skinny and person-like that you always had the feeling that they were looking over your shoulder. Around their heads at this time of year, they wore crowns of bright red fruits split open like mouths. And the ocotillos were the dead looking thorny sticks that stuck up out of the ground in clusters, each one with a flaming orange spike of flower buds at its top. These looked to me like candles from hell. 
As the storm moved closer, it broke into hundreds of pieces, so that the rain fell here and there from the high clouds in long, curving gray plumes. It looked like maybe 50 or 60 fires scattered over the city, except that the tall, smoky columns were flowing in reverse. And if you look closely, you could see that in some places, the rain didn't make it all the way to the ground. Three quarters of the way down from the sky, it just vanished into the dry air. That was when we smelled the rain. It was so strong that it was more than a smell. When we stretched out our hands, we could practically feel it rising up from the ground. I don't know how a person could describe that scent. It certainly wasn't sour, but it wasn't sweet either. Not like a flower. To my mind, it was like nothing so much as a wonderfully clean, scrubbed pine floor. I wondered if the smell was really so great, or if it just seemed that way to us because of what it meant. Because of what it meant, Finding the meaning is always the challenge, and that's just what Arizona's writers have been trying to do since they first saw this place. But believe me, when you experience your first desert rainstorm, you know unmistakably what it means. So all you have to do is pray for rain. The third constant of Arizona's landscapes is this. The place is rugged, rugged ferociously rugged, and it's always surprising. John Gregory Bork, uh, whom I mentioned earlier, served as an officer in the Apache Wars, and in his memoir, On the Border with Crook, published in 1891, he describes the Tonto Basin, the country you see between Pesu and the Mogollon Rim, northeast of Phoenix. The course of those who were to accompany General Crook was nearly due west along the rim of what is called the Mogollon Plateau, or mountain, a range of very large size and great elevation covered on its summit with a forest of large pine trees. It is a strange upheaval, a freak of nature, a mountain canted up on one side. One rides along the edge and looks down two or three thousand feet into what is termed the Tonto Basin a weird scene of grandeur and rugged beauty. The basin is a basin only in the sense that it is lower than the ranges enclosing it, the Mogollon, the Azatzal, the Sierra Ancha. But its whole triangular area is also cut up, so cut up by ravines, arroyos, small stream beds, and hills of very good height that it may safely be pronounced one of the roughest spots on the globe. It is plentifully watered by the affluence of the Rio Verde and its East Fork, and by the Tonto and the Little Tonto. Since the subjugation of the Apaches, it has produced abundantly of peaches and strawberries, and potatoes have done wonderfully on the summit of the Mogollon itself and in the sheltered swales in the pine forest. At the date of our march, all this section of Arizona was still unmapped, and we had to depend on Apache guides to conduct us until within sight of the Mazatzal range, four or five days out from Camp Apache. The most singular thing to note about the Mogollon was the fact that all the streams which flowed upon its surface in almost every case made their way to the north and east into Chevalon Fork, even where they had their origins in springs almost upon the crest itself. It is an awe-inspiring sensation to be able to sit or stand upon the edge of such a precipice and look down upon a broad expanse mantled with juicy grasses, the paradise of livestock. The Tonto Basin was well equipped with deer and other wild animals, as well as with mezcal, Spanish bayonet, acorn-bearing oak, walnuts, and other favorite foods of the Apaches while the higher levels of the Mogollon and the other ranges were at one and the same time pleasant abiding places during the heats of summer and ramparts of protection against the sudden incursion of an enemy. They marched across the Mogollon Rim for 11 days in search of that enemy, Bork recounts, without incident. But even though he had his mind on war, being a soldier, he writes everywhere they went across that rugged landscape 
we saw spread out before us a carpet of colors which would rival the best examples of the looms of Turkey or Persia. And that's a fourth constant of Arizona's landscapes. They are astonishingly beautiful, even if they sometimes require us to recalibrate what we think beautiful is, what our sense of beautiful is when we first arrive here. And that beauty drives the just-so stories and the coyote tales of the first peoples, and the exploring reports of the Spanish conquistadors and Anglo military surveyors, and the shoot 'em up novels of Zane Grey and Louis L'Amour, and the natural histories and romances and poems and mystery novels that Arizonans produce today. The land is the central fact here. It's a character in every book, and it's the great constant that joins the best writing about Arizona from one generation to the next. And here is a little bit of one of the finest evocations of this place that I know, and I think one of the central pieces of literature of Arizona, and that is the Navajo night chant. And as you listen to it, imagine that you can hear rain falling softly at first, hard at times, upon the red earth. In the house made of the dawn, in the house made of the evening twilight, in the house made of the dark cloud, in the house made of he rain, in the house made of dark mist, in the house made of she rain, in the house made of pollen, in the house made of grasshoppers, where the dark mist curtains the doorway, the path to which is on the rainbow, where the zigzag lightning stands high on top, where the he rain stands high on top, with your moccasins of dark cloud come to us, with your leggings of dark cloud come to us, with your shirt of dark cloud come to us, with your headdress of dark cloud come to us, with your mind enveloped in dark cloud come to us, with the dark thunder above you come to us soaring, with the shapen cloud at your feet come to us soaring. And that makes the rain come. And after the rain has come, the singer has this to say. With beauty before me, I walk. With beauty behind me, I walk. With beauty below me, I walk. With beauty above me, I walk. With beauty all around me, I walk. And so it is with all of us who live in this hot, windy, dusty, dry, but always beautiful place called Arizona. And I thank you for allowing me to share some of it with you.